George Papashvili came to Bucks County, Pennsylvania in 1935, and here at Ertoba Farm, he lived and worked for the next 45 years. He was born in 1898 in Georgia, a small, once independent country that lies between the Black and Caspian Seas and is now one of the Soviet republics. Some of his earliest sculptures reflect the life he knew in his homeland. Here, wearing a felt cloak and holding his bagpipe, is a Georgian folk singer. The fat-tailed ram is a special breed of sheep raised on farms in the Caucasus. As a boy, George had a pet bear, and bears were always a favorite subject. He carved almost 50. Here are two playing and another scraping stolen honeycomb from his teeth. Next to bears, he liked otters. And when someone asked him why, he said, because even when they are old, otters never stop playing. This is the studio where George worked. Beyond is a figure of a dog, but it is more than an animal. It is a symbol of George's social concern. During the Second World War, he saw a news photo of a dog nursing its own puppy and a starving child in the bombed ruins of Sevastopol, and he carved this piece. A dreadful mind disaster moved him to do a somber memorial to the men who died underground. The eagle sheltering a rabbit is called the Peaceable Kingdom. It reflects his hope for a day when all wars might be over and the world would live in peace. George had representative shows in many museums, galleries, and institutions throughout the United States during his lifetime, but he liked best to exhibit close to our home in eastern Pennsylvania, where our friends and neighbors might come and see his work. The retrospective that follows opened at the Kemmerer Museum, housed in a fine mid-19th century dwelling in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the gift of Mr. and Mrs. Peter Pritchett to their community. The red granite mongoose, a sculpture in the round, standing <clears throat> by the fireplace, is one of the last major pieces George made. Set in the bay window at the opposite end of the drawing room is his first sculpture in stone, You with Lamb in Indiana limestone. It is flanked by two other early pieces, Puppies Playing and Pomparo, his horse. Pomparo means mane in my husband's native language, Georgian. During his lifetime, George carved over 600 sculptures, no two alike, some monumental, too large for a gallery, some, as you will see, very small. Looking at George's first and last pieces, and these sculptures on the terrace representative of the many he carved over the years, it is easy to see his style was constant, simple, economical, direct. He avoided deep undercutting, projections, elaboration of detail to disturb the mass. He often said, what you leave out is as important as what you put in. All natural forms interested him, animals, birds, flowers, fruits. Least often did he do the human figure. This piece, carved from Coopersburg granite, is a war casualty, a refugee who has lost home, family, friends. All that is left is enclosed within the canvas wrapped around him as he mourns. The sculpture is called War's End. George found stone everywhere, on mountaintops and fields, from riverbeds along the beach. The birds are carved from a rich red granite quarried in Wausau, Wisconsin. George had no formal training in art. He was entirely self-taught. In 1940, he started carving in wood, 
and shortly thereafter he began to work in stone. He was a direct carver. His method was simple. He found a stone that fit the subject he had in mind, or in some cases suggested a subject to him. He leveled the bottom of the stone so it would sit flat on the bench and he began. He never made a preliminary drawing on a paper, a model in clay, nor used a photograph, but merely chalked a two-dimensional sketch on a single surface and then carved directly into the material, letting the figure develop from the color and texture his chisel revealed. This frigate bird is made of the famous black granite from a quarry in Pennsylvania, a beautiful material that chisels to many shades of gray and polishes to coal black, very difficult to work, but worth the effort. The moth, with a butterfly on the reverse, is of quartzite diorite. The capybara, the largest rodent in the world, a rather benign creature, is carved from a glittering white stone with pale yellow flecks that comes from a beach in California. Animal rock, a relief with ram and a bull on reverse faces, and the raccoon are also made of quartzite diorite. The otter and the albatross are from porphyry. Diorite and porphyry are two extremely hard stones. The Egyptians made sculptures from both, so we know this material endures. The otter is now in the children's room of the main branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia and should survive little petting hands for three or 4,000 years. Some of George's techniques may be observed by looking at the smaller sculptures in the upper gallery at the Kemmerer Museum. By using various kinds of chisels with different points and by polishing certain areas in the sculpture, it is possible to create a variety of tonal qualities in the stone, as in this prairie chicken. A high polish defines the black beak. Incising creates the shaft, chiseling the gray feather mass. With the three horses, a high polish intensifies the natural dappling in the quartzite diorite and gives the horses a sleek coat. Rough pointing with the chisel produces a flowing mane or, as with this horse, a rough coat. Some pieces, such as these four little bears carved from gemstone, require an overall polish to bring out their full color. The sculpture of the boy with his dog called Mark with Pug, is carved from marble, the classic stone of sculpture, because it takes on a lustrous quality with polishing. Action can also be developed, as in the playing pottos carved from jadeite, by contrasting rough and highly polished surfaces. The moth is Brazilian zoosite with small ruby inclusions, which give iridescence to the wings of the insect. Depth, too, can be suggested, as in the figure of an animal here, hiding deep in the leaves. Direct carving allows the sculptor to change his original conception as a stone reveals new qualities to him. Working on this fish, George found a ring of white in the green serpentine. And as he said, he set the fish in the pool then instead of the stream. The fox and many of his other pieces are carved in the round. He also carved in relief, as in the owl feeding young, which has an entirely different subject on the reverse, a lynx. My husband liked to carve fruit. A little girl once asked him, how did you make this sculpture? He said, first I carved the pear, and then one day I cut it in half, and I found the core. A pear, an apple, a goat, 
a rabbit, a moth, an insect, or a pollen grain. I think he always knew what was waiting for him inside the stone. George never signed his pieces. What difference does it make in a hundred years who made a sculpture, he said. Do we like it more or less if we know a name? Here on the cover of the catalog of the retrospective are my husband's initials in the letters of the Georgian alphabet, G above, P beneath. In his work lies his full signature. <laughs>